Okay. Hello, Mr. Mr. Hello, Professor Balcerovich. Yes, I am here. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I'm happy that we were able to uh, get you on Thank the line you. today. Okay. So, okay. Um, okay. Uh, we are going to actually go ahead and get started since we're a couple minutes behind the starting time. Um, Club officer Annabella is going to be introducing you today. However, she her camera is not working, but her microphone is working. So, okay, uh, okay. you know, it's it's okay. the the tech stuff. So I'm just going to go ahead and say welcome, everyone. My name is Nathan Silverstein. I'm the founder and president of the Polish Club at UT today. Because she is an international business major, Polish Club officer Annabella Nina Mia will have the honor of introducing Professor Balcerowicz. Before I hand the metaphorical microphone over to her, however, I want to acknowledge that today is the 84th anniversary of Nazi Germany's invasion of Poland. Hitler's invasion of Poland took place on September 1st, 1939 and marked the beginning of World War II. My thoughts are with the millions of innocent victims who lost their lives, as well as all the heroes who sacrificed their lives to fight evil. With that said, Annabella, take it away. Thank you, Nathan. Hello, everyone. My name is Annabella Ninomia. I am the administrative officer of the Polish Club at the University of Texas at Austin, where I'm, I'm also majoring in international business. Today, I have the honor of introducing Professor Leszek Balcerowicz. Today's event is being hosted by the Polish Club at, at UT, a registered student organization. This is not an event sponsored by the University of Texas, Texas at Austin. The views expressed today are of the invited guest speaker and do not represent the views of the student organization, the university, or its officers. This event is being recorded and will be posted on the Polish Club's website, where we will have a virtual library with recordings of all of our past guest speakers. I would like to thank our co-sponsors, UT Center for Russian, Eastern European, and Eurasian Studies, the Center for European Studies, Liberal Arts Honors, Texas Global, the Department of Government, the Department of International Relations and Government, the Straw Center for International Security and Law, and the Department of Economics. I am excited to announce today's speaker, Poland's former Minister of Finance from 1989 to 1991 and 1997 to 2000, former president of the Polish National Bank from 2001 to 2007, two-time former Deputy Prime Minister of Poland and current professor of economics at the Warsaw School of Economics, Mr. Leszek Barsarowicz. Professor Barsarowicz was born in Lipno, Poland. He earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from the Warsaw School of Economics. During the Solidarity Movement, he served as an economic advisor to the Solidarity Trade Union. When Professor Basarowicz became Poland's Minister of Finance in 1989, he faced one of the greatest challenges that an economist can, having to completely change a country's economic system. Professor Basarowicz was tasked with transforming Poland's almost 50-year-old state-owned socialist economic system to a free market capitalist system. He initiated a series of sweeping reforms which ended hyperinflation, balanced the national budget, and eliminated inefficient economic institutions. These reforms came to be known as the Barcelona Plan, or shock therapy. While initially criticized by some as overly aggressive, the Barcelona Plan quickly started producing positive results, and since 1991, Poland has experienced consecutive annual economic growth. Today, the Barcelona Plan is widely regarded as a major success and a feat in the history of economics. Today, Professor Barcelona will be giving brief introductory remarks about shock therapy Poland's transition from communism to capitalism. Professor Bosarowicz will then take Q&A for the remaining time, which will be moderated by Polish club president Nathan Silverstein. It is my great honor to now welcome a titanic figure in world economics, Professor Leszek Bosarowicz. Thank you very much. So I am supposed to say a few words. Yes, the floor is yours, Professor Bosarowicz. OK, very short. As you know, I was born in Poland a long time ago. I graduated from the most open economic faculty in Poland, which was foreign trained faculty. And then I graduated from St. John's University MBA in economics. However, I decided to return to Poland. I have no illusions about the limits of the system, which was imposed by the Soviet Union. But for some reason, I decided to stay there at the same time trying uh, from within to improve it, 
to the extent was possible. I had no hope that democracy could be introduced in my country, but at least uh, I've been trying to improve the economy. Starting from 78, 78, I created an informal group of then young economists and our ultimate model was a worker site management, not because we thought it was the best one, but we thought this is the maximum which would be obtainable. And we were ready with our proposals in 1980. Solidarity movement under Leg Valencia has adopted, accepted uh, this proposal. Then, however, there was an introduction of martial law in December 81. <clears throat> And we continue working uh, informally without seeing the light in the tunnel. But we have as a group about uh, 10, 15 person continued studies on uh, various uh, institutional systems, including free market economy. And when unexpectedly the Soviet Union started to loosen up under Gorbachev and possibilities for reforms in Poland uh, increased, there was a great demand for unofficial reform proposals, and it turned out that you were the only ones who had more or less read this. So this is why the first uh, non-communist uh, prime minister, Tadosh Mazowiecki, turned to me. I initially declined because I was supposed to go to Britain, but then accepted, and so it started. Now, uh, I have a group of people without people with whom I worked before, I would never dare to, uh, to accept this Venturum's uh, proposals. I knew that we have to be very fast on stabilization because Poland faced hyperinflation in the second half of 1990, some 20, 30% a month. And then we would have to be fast on the liberalization and deeper institutional change. This is more or less the essence of the program, which was elaborated in the last month of 89 and then launched on the 1st of uh, uh, January 1990. There, was, there were limits in speed, unavoidable ones. Uh, namely, stabilization and liberalization can be introduced rather fast. Uh, uh, deeper institutional change, including privatization, uh, requires more time, unavoidable. <clears throat> and it was a, uh, the challenge was not only to launch these fast moving uh, measures, but to keep on track, uh, into, uh, including privatization. Without that, Poland would become a different, uh, another Belarusian. Because without privatization, you can have economic development and you can't have democracy. And we started with democracy, rule of law, and comprehensive economic program. For some reasons, we managed to keep on track. I would not describe all the uh, events, but different parties have more or less maintained the previous reforms and contributed to some extent with different speed, even so-called post-communists continue some reforms, but sl slower than we have initiated. Now, this has changed since 19 2016 because we have a party which officially classified as right, not left, but this is the most, the leftist parties which ever had. In Poland, uh, I am uh, referring to so-called law and justice in Poland peace, because what have been they doing? First, they try to capture the justice system, which is against the rule of law. First of all, they captured prosecution. To some extent, they attacked uh, uh, judiciary. Second, they violated Poland's constitution especially regulations on the division of powers. Uh, third, they uh, reversed the direction on the economic reforms because they introduced some major nationalizations. Fourth, they increased social spending, especially on pensioners, not because they are so empathic, but because they wanted to have some votes. 
Uh, as a result, we have they have increased the ratio of sp uh, spending to GDP and taxation and budget deficit. And nowadays, we are paying uh, one of the highest rates in borrowing uh, to finance uh, the public uh, budget deficit. Now, so after six years of or seven years in power, we have a quite a challenge. Economy has slowed down to recession. With this distorted economic model, there is, uh, we don't, I don't think there's much hope for rapid continued economic growth. So we're facing the Italian disease and we have a damaged uh, justice system. So the coming elections in 50 days are almost as important as those in 1989. They will decide whether Poland would return to the previous path and to democracy, uh, fully fledged market economy and the related uh, economic growth, or would continue on this uh, bad path initiated some six, seven years ago. What I can say, I do my best to contribute to the good scenario. Uh, working uh, within the so, uh, uh, working with the, within the society, civic society, and I hope, and this is a reasonable, not completely optimistic hope, that you would have a fundamental change uh, after the coming elections. So, so much for my introduction. Um, the floor is yours. The most interesting part is always Q and A. Mm. All right. Well, thank you very much, Professor Balcerovich, for your very enlightening introductory remarks. Um, to now move over to the Q&A portion of the event. First, we're going to start with some more historical questions about the Balcerovich plan, and then we're going to transition slowly uh, into more contemporary questions. First question, over three decades later, how do you assess the Balcerovich's a plan's place in history. Do you think the plan was successful, unsuccessful, somewhere in between, and why? We have to judge uh, policies by results. And if you look at results in comparison with other countries, then Poland increased the GDP per capita the most, much more than for the Czech Republic, Romania, Bulgaria, etc., etc. First, second, we started from hyperinflation, and we brought down inflation to two percent when I was the governor of the central bank. Third, we managed to uh, build a reasonable justice system and the rule of law. And in every international comparison, until recently, you can check it. Poland uh, has achieved a very high place. So this is, this is not my personal view. These are these are checkable facts, and this is why it is uh, even more important to return to the previous uh, path in Poland. Thank you very much. What I'm understanding from what you just said is that it's not just your opinion, but it's widely accepted uh, that the Balcerovich plan was a success. However, I'm curious, is there anything you wish you had done differently in implementing the Balcerovich plan? Not differently, but even faster. The speed, I don't know whether it had been possible to move even faster, but I would, uh, I would try to. I was not dealing with everything. I was not dealing with the justice system. So I was not responsible for that, but I would say for the in the distance that uh, reforms in the justice system should have been quicker than they were. But the uh, Mazowiecki government was a coalition government. And the responsibility for, was shared. Very, very fascinating, given the fact that one of the things people criticize uh, you and the Balcerovich plan for is that it was almost too fast and too aggressive. So the fact that you're saying that you wish you had implemented changes faster is very uh, interesting. Criticize 
to some extent, are under the impression of the very emotional wording shock therapy. When they hear shock, they're afraid. <laughs> so terminology is very important. I never use this expression shock therapy. I was speaking about radical, radical reforms. Thank you for clarifying that. You mentioned that Poland is now either in recession or heading towards recession. Um, however, up until recently, Poland has experienced consistent economic growth for over 30 years. When I tell people that Poland's economy at least was thriving until very recently, they always want to know why. So my qu next question is, what have been the main sources of Poland's economic success? Well, I would say first that we avoided so far a major crisis. We didn't have any crisis in the banking sector, as distinct from some Western economies. And uh, even though our fiscal side was far from perfect, so far we never suffered a fiscal crisis, like say in uh, Greece or in Italy. First, so no negative shocks. I'm afraid they are coming, but so far for the 30 years, no. Second, uh, we have a right beginning on structural or institutional reforms. And as I said, until recently, there was a continuation of these reforms. Third, uh, the reversal started 2016, but it was had been gradual nationalization, more regulation, more fiscal spending. And it takes time, sometimes several years, before the beginning of better worse policies and their results. And I'm afraid we are just starting to feel the results this year. Thank you, Professor Balcerovich. Earlier on, you mentioned in your introductory remarks that Poland has been more successful in its economic transition than any other Eastern, former Eastern Bloc country. So my next question is, why is that? No, again, I can repeat. First, uh, avoiding a major crisis, because crisis is always a negative growth. And second, continued in, uh, radical beginning, and then continued improvement of the economic engine which is economic system, what does it mean? Privatization of the economy, both uh, spontaneous growth of the private sector and privatization of most, but not all, unfortunate uh, state-run enterprises, deregulation, and a reasonable rule of law. So um, political uncertainty until recently was reduced at low level. So, conditions for private investment coming created by the political bodies uh, not bad but this as i have said unfortunately has changed right i suppose i asked that follow-up question just because uh you know having studied the history of the region i know that a lot of other um, former eastern bloc countries were sort of following the same blueprint as far as transitioning to capitalism. So uh, I just found it kind of interesting why Poland was so much more successful, but I suppose that's would require going into each country and analyzing their political climate since then. So um, I think I, I will just transition to the next question. So Poland has been incredibly successful as we've established. Um, largely due to the Balcerowicz plan in transitioning to capitalism. What can the rest of the world learn from Poland's successful transition from socialism to capitalism? Well, depending on the, that depends on the initial conditions. If you have a private economy, you don't need to privatize. You, you have a large dose of state, state owned enterprises, it, you, you, you should privatize because it is not a question of a national culture. It is something more serious. State ownership is the power to the politicians, and the political power should be strictly limited. This is something we know from the history uh, and constitution of the US. 
political power, a state power should be limited to some unavoidable things like uh, uh, protection against uh, common uh, crimes and uh, justice, justice system, especially the criminal justice system. Civil justice system does not need to be completely state on, state run. Thank you. Speaking of political power and political economic power, uh, what, how large of an issue is corruption in Poland, if at all? Well, one should distinguish between petty or common corruption, meaning taking bribes, public officials taking bribes, and political corruption, which means the politicians take over the state apparatus. I think we had, of course, we have had uh, uh, this petty corruption, but never, for some reasons, in a, a astronomic uh, proportions. And I think the main reason was that we have introduced fast privatization. And reasonably efficient uh, justice system. What has increased in Poland recently is what they call political corruption when politicians take over state-owned enterprises and give themselves, their friends and their families the jobs, sometimes very lucrative jobs. And the conclusion is that if you want to avoid this very serious disease, political corruption, you have to eliminate the state sector from the economy, which is, would be also very good and beneficial for economic growth. Right. That transitions uh, well into my next question, which is in the upcoming parliamentary elections and referenda, one of the questions the current Polish government is asking is, quote, do you support the sale of state enterprises to foreign entities leading to the loss of control by Poles over strategic sectors of the economy, end quote? Why would the current Polish government ask such a question when they, as you mentioned, have overseen many, a large increase in privatization and also the fact that they just recently oversaw the sale of significant state-owned petroleum assets to Saudi Arabian and Hungarian purchasers? Because they are the most dishonest politicians we ever had after 89, meaning they are trying to, to cheat, to brainwash, less educated electorate. It's nothing to do with truth, what they are asking, and they've been using, if you know policy, you know that they are using an invective but Polish in Polish, wyprzedaż means not only sale, it means bad sale, something corrupt. So asking this pseudo question shows the degree of depravity that which they are uh, manifesting. Uh, so this is, uh, I mean, the, the ways of the behaving their propaganda was uh, has been unprecedented. We never had after '89 such such a dishonesty in uh, communicating or approaching or brainwashing uh, the people. Thank you. You mentioned earlier that Poland is either in reform or heading, or sorry, is in either in recession or heading towards recession, uh, and you mentioned you stated that rule of law concerns in Poland and kind of political, major political turmoil are potential reasons for that. So my question is, do you believe that the current government's rule of law policies are directly connected and have potentially caused this recession that's either happening or is looming on the horizon? No, this is one of the reasons, not the only reason, but political manipulation or political use of prosecution increases uncertainty and risk, including among the private entrepreneurs. And this contributes to the declining rate of investment. Poland has now a rate of investment in the range between 16 and 17 percent, which is very low. And, and part of it is a state investment. 
and some of the state finance uh, projects res resemble the worst excesses of socialism. So they are building, for example, new airport far away from Warsaw, just to impress. It, 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 it serves the purposes of a crude propaganda. So, unfortunately, by bad policies, both economic and uh, policies in the range of the justice system, increase risks and lower investment and uh, lower the rate of economic growth. So if this continues, as I said, I hope it would not. But if this continues, then uh, we would be facing uh, longer term stagnation or very low growth. At the same time, we have a very high inflation. So the name for this is stagflation. Why do you, th that actually, that segues very nicely into the next question, which is why do you think some foreign investors are hesitant to invest in Poland? But they are not as hesitant as Polish investors. <laughs> because paradoxically, or perhaps not, large foreign investors feel more protected, including by their governor, the governments, than uh, Polish investors who have only Polish government. So uh, uh, Polish investment done by definition by Polish investors decline much more than foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment is a percentage of GDP, to my knowledge, has not declined very much. But domestic investment, so this is a paradoxical because at the same time, the present government presents itself as defending the Polish interests. But the, by a policy of increasing risks, they're reducing domestic investment. You mentioned that uh, foreign investment in Poland has not declined to your knowledge, which prompts the question, why do some foreign investors consider Poland an appealing place to invest? A large, relatively large country. First, with a large market, which has much increased thanks to previous economic growth, export-oriented country. Fortunately, this could not have been reversed. It's very important for Poland's economic growth to be in an open country, so some investors invest in order to export from Poland. And third, as I already mentioned, foreign direct investors are, could, can be defended by their governments. Who would defend Polish investors against Polish government? All right. Thank you. As we all know, there's a tragic war that Russia is waging in Ukraine right next door to Poland. Um, I can only, uh, using common sense, imagine that for some, that, it, that the war being so close and the fear of a spillover, although those who are educated about NATO are probably not too worried about that. But regardless, uh, I'm sure that that is creating a bit of a chilling effect, at least among some businesses, as far as foreign investment in Poland goes. So my question is, how has Russia's nearby war in Ukraine affected Poland's economy, if at all? Well, I cannot detect a visible sign of a chill among foreign indirect investors investing in Poland. But if the most important outcome of Russia's aggression against Ukraine is a great influx of the Ukrainians, into Poland, especially women, because younger men has to serve in the army. And I'm happy to say that so far there were no major tensions and there are rather friendly relationships. I'm, I'm not speaking about official contacts, I mean human contacts. Myself, I have some many Ukrainian friends. And my friends have friends among Ukrainians who emigrated for some time to, to Poland. So what you're saying is that the influx of Ukrainian refugees in Poland has positively affected po the Polish economy. They control the, the larger part of immigrants working in Poland, yes. But we are also getting more and more people from other countries, including Africa. You, now that you mentioned Africa, actually, I'm going to transition over to a different question. 
why does the Polish current government, why does the current Polish government use so much anti-immigrant rhetoric when it has actually welcomed more immigrants from Asia, the Middle East and Africa than any previous Polish administration? They are cheating. Oh, one certainly, you should understand that uh, these people at the top and their operators do not have moral inhibitions. So they will do whatever they think serves their purposes, unless there is a risk of uh, being committing a crime and being captured. You know, people uh, in every society, people differ in their morality. And what are the worst times or bad times for a country? But morally bad people achieve positions of power. And this happens in history of various countries, especially Germany, much more than nowadays in Poland, of course. But we are having this sort of tendency in Poland, and especially those at the top, uh, they've been using extremely immoral, manipulative propaganda, which consists of distortions and lies. They captured what is called public TV and public radio, and this instrument of unbelievable lies and propaganda. By the way, this is why this station should be privatized. Right. Yeah. right. Um, earlier on, we were discussing the war in Ukraine, and as many people have likely seen recently, just a few months ago, uh, Poland and I believe four other Eastern European countries introduced and passed legislation saying that Ukrainian grain was not allowed, would not be allowed to be sold in those countries because it was flooding their local markets and uh, devaluing the value of their own Polish uh, grain. And my question is, do you agree with the Polish government and the EU's decision to prevent Ukrainian grain from being sold in Poland? And I know that that law is up for a kind of, it needs to be passed yet again and, and, or extended in a, just a short time. And do you believe that it should be? First of all, I think uh, it should be a responsibility of the countries, of the governments of Central Eastern Europe to provide a safe transit to seaports and avoid in this way various tensions and problems with domestic uh, peasants. This is my position. So, but do you believe that the ban on selling uh, Ukrainian grain in those local neighboring markets, should it be extended as well? No, or just can, as I said, I can repeat, transit, a safe transit of Ukrainian grain I understand uh, the protests among the Polish farmers, even though I would not perhaps accept it, but I understand. And every government uh, has to take care of this. Because the solution would be a transit. Okay, so understood. So you believe that the ban should be extended, but the travel should be continue to be allowed, uh, trans transporting the grain um, from Ukraine through those local countries that are banning the sale of grain in those countries to other places in the world. Um, earlier on, you also mentioned how there, the Polish government, the current Polish government is offering kind of more subsidies, sort of socialized programs. For example, there's been uh, extent, uh, extending the retirement, or sorry, lowering the retirement age as well as the famous Pięćset Plus program, which is Pięćset 500 um, plus, meaning that families receive, they used to receive 500 złote, which is the Polish currency, per child per month, just for having children. Now it's been increased to 800 złote to uh, supposedly adjust for inflation. So let's start with the retirement age. That is another one of the questions in one of the upcoming uh, referenda. So do you think Poland should raise its uh, retirement age, keep it where it is, uh, and why? Well, the choice is between 
having less people working with serious consequences for older people, especially younger people, or increasing the retirement age. And this sort of question should have been asked. Not because if you ask people, do you want to increase the retirement age? That's it. What would they respond? 80% would say no. <laughs> so this is a stupid question. The not stupid question is, if we keep the retirement age, then we would have less people working with aging and more people on pensions, and this would be bring about such and such consequences. If you increase retirement age, we can avoid this and this. That should be phrased in, a, of course, in a clear manner without manipulation. I see. So you you just mentioned, you know, you mostly just addressed uh, how the question is phrased. But do you personally believe that the exact that the retirement age should be raised? I am for Poland. I was supporting the previous uh, increase of retirement age by the previous government, of Donald Tusk. This was a responsible and sensible way. And sec secondly, as an economist who specializes in economic growth issues, I understand that the, the rate of growth, Poland has to continue catching up because we still have a pretty long way to go. If you lower retirement age, you would stop or jeopardize this historic process. So we should not reduce the retirement age. And this is the choice. Thank you. How do you think the now 800 zloty per month uh, that families receive, Polish families receive per child per month in Poland affects the Polish economy? This is a, first of all, the question of the budget. The budget means spending, deficit, taxes, and political parties, including, first of all, law and justice, have not presented any calculations. And those opposition parties who accept this, they're equally dishonest or irresponsible. But fortunately, we have independent economists, and we know that if this 800 slotters would be introduced, we would have higher taxes and or higher deficit and more uh, expensive borrowing. And this would be detrimental after a long while to, to most people in Poland. So this is a political bribe. And according to the surveys I have uh, read, this is not extremely popular. If people are not as stupid as peace politicians imagine. Poland has been a member of the EU for quite some time now. And uh, as we know, the Eurozone program is something that some EU member states have chosen to implement and others have not. Will Poland enter the Eurozone in the near future? Why or why not? Well, from the point of view of Poland's economic growth, in my mind, this is not a priority, meaning and quick entry in the, the Eurozone. Look at Greece and the recent, they enter very quickly, but this has not removed the necessity of internal reforms in Greece. In Poland, we should change the government, remove distortions, liberalize the economy, introduce or reintroduce the independence of the justice system, stabilize the public finance, speed up economic growth. So internal domestic reforms and quick introduction of Euro in Poland does not in my mind belong to priorities. I am not excluding it to be sure, but I'm not saying this is important from the Poland's economic growth in the near future. Speaking of the future, I have read in many places that Poland's economy is uh, projected to surpass even the UK in GDP by 2030, for example. Do you, what do you think is, I understand that 
you, you know, you're not an expert in political forecasting and that that's generally. Uh, Fortunately, I am not an expert in po political forecasting. Right, I am an expert right. in analyzing and comparing economic institutional systems and their consequences. OK, please uh, continue. Yeah. No, just, you know, hedging that question with the statement that political forecasting is always a risky uh, pursuit. Do you expect that Poland, for example, would surpass the UK in GDP by 2030 or other major uh, nations by that time period? You cannot make an unconditional forecast. This would be absurd. You have to make some assumptions about policies in the uh, countries being compared. So if we assume a catastrophic policy in Britain and reasonable policy in Poland, <laughs> then <laughs> you can pretty safely say it's not a very distant future Poland uh, would uh, approach the per capita income in Britain. But this, of course, begs a question. What would explain the policies which you assume? Right. I, am, I myself am not an economist. I'm just a, a student of Polish politics and what's in current affairs. So I'm just repeating what I are asking you about what it's I okay, it's okay. read. Yeah, I'm asking you about what I've personally read, uh, I, but I, I do understand the political forecasting. Be, is a risk be, very, be very selective in what you read. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, I tend to... Uh, to favor the uh, you know reputable sources, but I suppose that's what I advise. Okay. Uh, something else that's been in the news recently, and obviously it's been going around along for quite some time now, uh, but it's been resurfacing just in the last couple of days in Polish politics, and that's the issue of reparations. The Polish government's call for reparations from the German government uh, for the Nazi invasion and occupation of Poland during World War II and all the lives lost and destruction caused. The Polish government is calling for $1.3 trillion in reparations, which is of course adjusted for inflation. Do you think Poland should receive reparations from Germany and why? Not a question of what I wish or do not wish. <laughs> this is a question of reality. And to my knowledge, this issue has been already settled. And if this is the case, then the present government is cheating. In Poland is cheating. Poland's uh, Polish people. Can you elaborate a little bit more as to what when you say that the issue has been settled? Because I understand that that's a common sort of talking point, and the Polish government claims that it hasn't been settled, and then some people claim it has been. So could you just, for the audience's sake, um, help explain? why you believe that it's been an issue that's You have been to said. approach people who specialize in constitutional law and international treaties first. But second, as a rule of thumb, I would never believe promises of the present Polish government. Right. Uh, this is another sort of uh, political forecasting question, you know, I, I usually like to conclude the meetings with just one or two of these questions. I understand that they're incredibly hard to answer. Uh, and if even if you don't want to answer it, then that's OK. But we see that Poland has some serious ideological differences with the EU, at least under the current Polish government. The question is, if Poland is under another government like it is now in the future with which is uh, many would regard as right or far right. Uh, and the, and Poland has, assuming Poland has already caught up with Western Europe economically by that point, do you think that, do you think Poland might leave the EU at some point due to those ideological differences once they're done fully catching up economically? Well, first, I don't ex understand what is ideological differences. Do you refer to different propaganda? In Poland, the present government is using hostile propaganda against what it considers its enemies, but this is a very bad practice. The uh, majority of Polish population does not believe in this sort of propaganda, and we have a, and a rightly regards Poland's membership in uh, European Union and also in NATO. 
is a very important fact, fundamental of Poland's situation after 89. And based on that, I don't imagine any Polish government which would lead to Poland's abandoning the European Union. All right. By to clarify, since you asked, by ideological differences, I mean, for example, we're seeing Poland under the current Polish government, so not necessarily representative of the people, but under the mm. current Polish government, we're seeing Poland clash with uh, the EU over social issues and cultural issues like LGBT and things of that nature. We also are seeing there's constant clashes between the two over uh, rule of law concerns, democratic institutions, especially when it comes to the Polish judiciary, things of that nature. That's what I mean by ideological differences. Okay, okay, I understand, okay. But, okay, well, I, uh, but this uh, sort of aggression on the Polish side does not enjoy an overwhelming support in Poland. Right. And I yes. think this, this is fundamentally important. Yes, yes, I agree. But just to clarify, since you asked, that's what I meant. Uh, so that concludes my questions. We technically, you know, agreed to have the meeting go on for another 10 minutes. So I guess at this point, I'd like to check in with you, Professor Balcerowicz, and ask, uh, would you like to conclude the meeting? Or we can potentially open up the floor to Q&A from uh, more members. Uh, I prefer and... Q&A. Okay, okay. Uh, so let, so... Us use, let us use the remaining time for Q&A. Excellent. So everybody who's attending, there's a Q&A function where you can type in your questions and either Professor Balcerowicz will be able to re uh, read them or, or I can read them to him. I know that some people uh, were asking questions and raising their hands. So now if you have any pressing questions, things you're interested in that we haven't covered today in today's discussion, please feel free to type in a question into the Q&A. Um, Microsoft Teams. We have exhausted all the relevant questions I can see. Yes. Right. It was quite <laughs> the comprehensive discussion. Yes, thanks to you. Well, no, but you're you're too kind. It's thanks to you and your and your thorough replies. So um, alternatively, oh, here we have some questions. There we go. Okay, good. Mr. Jack McLaughlin asks, how much did U.S. and Western economic aid affect the Polish economy immediately after 1989 and going forward? That was one part which was very important. <clears throat> 1989, because of previous policies, Poland was, a, Poland was a bankrupt country. We have a huge foreign debt. And I had two priorities. First, improving Poland's economy on uh, macro and on uh, rule of law and uh, property rights. Second, obtaining the debt reduction. And they were going hand in hand. Without reforms, you would never, you could not even dream about the debt reduction. But somehow we co I combined this and Poland uh, got the debt reduction of 50%. I can. I would like to praise the role, crucial role of the United States, which was leading this uh, effort. So this was the most important aid we got, debt reduction. And later, not aid, but assistance or mutual benefit for indirect investment. Del Gerjargo. I'm. I'm I uh, apologize if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Dergur Jargul Uvsh is said and then asks, I'm honored to be here, turning back in time for the history of the rapid economic transition. Can you tell us about the opposition you faced at the time? There was almost no opposition. <laughs> Why? Because uh, everybody knew, both among the parliamentarians and the population at large, that Poland is is facing catastrophe, in a catastrophic, and they were not 
alternative savers. You know, it was very difficult for Mazowiecki to get anybody who would be willing to take responsibility for Poland's uh, economic situation. I only agree, as I said, only because I did some homework by chance and I have a team. So the initial program of radical stabilization, liberalization was adopted by overwhelming majority of all countries, or all parliamentarians in 89. And then when there was the second wave of reforms, which I was also chairing in uh, between 97 and 2000, majority supported acceleration of such reforms like, for example, privatization and stabilization of uh, public finance. Thank you. For th uh, I don't see any other questions from the audience in the Q&A section as of right now. So I will ask a follow-up question based on th something you just said, which is we've, we've been talking this whole meeting about how the Baltsarovich plan was implemented rapidly. And we've been talking more about whether that was good or bad and what the reactions were to that. But for those of us who are not economics experts or economists, why was it so important for the Baltsarovich plan to be implemented rapidly? Was it just kind of like a nip it in the bud, let's get to work as soon as possible type thing? Or, or why was that? Well, you have to distinguish three parts of initial economic plan. First, putting down inflation. If you have high inflation, it is like fire in your house. You cannot put it down slowly. <laughs> the house would burn. Second, liberalization, meaning extent of economic freedom. The more rapidly and broadly, the better, because then you set in motion powerful forces of economic private initiative. And the third, deeper structural change, deeper structural change, which takes more time, but it should not take ages. Uh, and this was pr including privatization of the economy. If uh, privatization was stopped, then there would be a political base for the reversal of the previous economic system, like it has happened in Belarus. Lukashenko, uh, Lukashenko, the present ruler since the early 90s, has frozen the state's overwhelming state sector. And thanks to that, thanks to the control of a society, if you have an overwhelming state sector, you can control society. Have frozen dictatorship and inefficient economy. Uh, I have another question that I just thought of, which is the current Polish government is widely considered to be, as I said, right or far right. And um, they often criticize communism and which you would expect of a far right party. However, we've discussed today that there's a lot of privatization, of a lot, a lot of nationalization in Poland. In fact, the, the and and a lot of socialist policies as well. You know, the 800 zwote that families receive per child per month. So my question is, do you also, or do you find it ironic that the Polish current Polish government doesn't necessarily practice what it preaches in terms of uh, communism, socialism? Uh, nationalization. Yes, that's a very fitting observation. But let me say, first of all, then this uh, terminology of left and right does not make any sense nowadays. It, were, it made sense in 17th century because of the position in the French parliament, but not anymore. So the, a better, more fitting description would be, on the one hand, statist, on one extreme, those who want to preserve the dominating role of the state in the economy, which leads to political corruption and to inefficiency, and to liberals, not in the American sense, but in the classical European sense, those who want to limit the extent of the state so that economic freedom, including uh, political, including, econ uh, including uh, property rights, can be Huge. So terminology plays enormous role. 
And to finish our discussion, I say the most one of the most important books I have read, and this was not included in my studies, was Formal Logic, which shows teaches you how it is important that the words have precise meaning. And the sentences have precise meaning. I think this is absolutely elementary and worth dedicate, dedicating some time. Thank you for that recommendation. And now, as we come up on the hour, I would like to th say thank you very much for all your time, for your thoughtful replies, and for helping educate all, me and, and all of the audience members about the current political and economic situation in Poland and about also a bit of history. We're great, we greatly appreciate you being here with us. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you. Goodbye. Give me a book.